Does it bother you that I'm surfing the phone? Yes. Who else is bothered? <laughs> Two people are bothered. You're bothered that I'm surfing the phone. It's Instagram. It's very interesting. <laughs> Please stand up. Nice. Sit down. I started by ignoring all of you. It bothered you. Then I gave you an utterly irrational, unjustified, crazy instruction. And literally all of you s slavishly obeyed it. You acted like robots. No thinking, no criticism, no critical thinking. What was the difference between the first my first behavior and my second behavior. First behavior, I did not see you. I did not see you. You did not exist for me. You were transparent. You were air. The second behavior, second thing I did, I saw you. I acknowledged your existence. I acknowledged you. I looked at you. I recognized that you exist. I recognized that you are here. And look at the power of being seen. Just by virtue of seeing you, I made you act completely irrationally. Seeing, being seen, is a critical part of human psychology. It's an enormous power. If you are not seen, you feel uncomfortable, you feel degraded, you feel humiliated, you feel rejected and you begin to develop mental illness. The source of most mental illnesses, if it's not biochemical, is not being seen. And if you are seen, even minimally, absolutely mini, mini, minimally, the person who sees you can make you do anything, as I just demonstrated to you. There are people here with academic degrees, with history, with families, and literally all of you rose to your feet and sat down for absolutely no good reason, just because I saw you. I will now let Julia introduce the event and fanzine. Julia, are you still here? <coughs> and then we will continue. The chair also recognizes Richard Grennan, who is hiding in the audience. And he's a master of all things narcissistic. <laughs> in the good way, I meant. <laughs> so being seen. There is an epidemic of not being seen as the number of people multiplies, there are 7.4 billion people now on this poor planet. When I was born, which was when the last dinosaurs were dying, there were 3 billion people. Today there's 7.4. It is more and more difficult to stand out. It's more and more difficult to be special. More and more difficult to be unique. We are not seen. No one sees us. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we lived in villages and small towns. We were embedded in communities. We had families. We don't have any of these things anymore. Very 
fewer and fewer people get married. 53% of all marriages in the West end in divorce. More than 70% of second and third marriages. The nuclear family is gone. Extended family is gone. Villages are gone. Communities are gone. We have no one left to see us. We are all atoms floating in space, single, desperate, lonely, unseen, invisible. It's an epidemic of invisibility. You saw how irritated you became that I was surfing my Instagram and ignoring all of you, and yet I am not a meaningful figure in your life. And this thing is passing. It's a one-hour experience. And with me, it's guaranteed to be a bad experience. So, and still, it got you irritated. And then you saw, once I acknowledge your existence, how I was able to manipulate all of you, almost without any exception, to do an utterly insane thing. So, being seen is a crucial, crucial thing. When, b when a baby is born, the first thing the baby cares about is to be seen. Because as a baby, if you are not seen, you're dead. Babies have a binary, babies exist in a binary state. Or they are seen, or they're dead. To be seen is a question of survival in the first few years of life. If you're not noticed, if you're not seen, you could die. So babies provoke their parents to see them. Babies cry do other things, smile, wave their hands and little feet to attract the attention of their parents to be seen. Again, it's all about being seen. And gradually the baby develops what we call object permanence, object constancy. The baby believes that even if mother is not in the room, she will be back and she will see him or her. Again, it's about being seen. One could reduce the overwhelming majority of human psychology to this single question, being seen. Every pathology, every pathology that's not biochemical emanates from this. And many of the drives, many of the behaviors, many of the traits have to do with exactly this. Why do you think you have private names? and not numbers. Why each and every one of you wears a different attire? Why are you in pink and you in green and you in black? And I mean, why all these things? Why are you doing all these things? Why are you not all wearing exactly the same thing? And why aren't all of you called Mago? <laughs> there is no good reason except one, to be special, to be unique to be identifiable, to be seen. That's the reason for, cl for the fashion industry, for makeup, for private names, for everything. It's all about being seen. It's the most crucial thing in life. And now, what happens to you when you are not seen as a child? There are many ways. There's only one way to be seen, only one, but many ways to not be seen. For example, you could simply be neglected and abandoned and ignored as a baby, as a child. That's a way to not be seen. Or you can be treated as an instrument, an instrument of gratification, to realize your mother's lost dreams or your father's hidden wishes, to become an extension of the parent to bring honor and pride to the family, to be put on a pedestal, to be worshipped and idolized. This sounds exactly the opposite of, being, of not being seen, but it is not being seen. Because the child is not seen as a child. The child is objectified. The minute the child is objectified, the child disappears and an object appears. When the child is not allowed to develop his or her boundaries, to separate and individuate, the child is not seen. 
So all this, pampering, spoiling, being put on a pedestal, being idolized, all these are forms of not seeing the child, forms of abuse. And how do children react to this? They react in three ways and two mental health conditions. Children react to this state of not being seen by remaining children for the rest of their life. They remain children until they die. And as children, they try to attract attention. They try to be seen. They were not seen when they were six years old. Maybe they will be seen when they are 60, or 16, or 26, or 36. They try and try and try again to be seen. And they never grow up, and they remain children. They are traumatized. That's the second reaction. Not being seen is a major trauma. And they are traumatized, and they are traumatized for life. This trauma, trauma never goes away. It's not something that heals. There's no scar tissue. It opens and reopens again and again and again every time the person is not seen. And of course, in, in life, very often we are not seen. We go to a government bureaucracy, we are not seen. <laughs> we, go, we go on a trip. Other people don't see us. We are not seen on many occasions. So remaining a child, infantilization, and being in a traumatic state, that's the second reaction. And the third reaction is what we call abandonment or separation anxiety. It is the fear of being abandoned or being separated from the person who sees us. That person could be an intimate partner or someone else. Abandonment and separation anxiety are overwhelming. And so when you put the three together, what do you get? When you put a person who never grows, always remains a child, never grows up, is always traumatized, and is terrified of abandonment and separation, what do you get? You get what we call cluster B personality disorder. You get borderline personality disorder. You also get narcissistic personality disorder, and you get codependency. These three characteristics are typical of both narcissists and codependents, borderlines and codependents. Now perhaps you understand why narcissists and codependents attract each other so powerfully. Now perhaps you understand the powerful attraction, the bond between narcissists and codependents. Because narcissists and codependents are flip sides of the same coin. They share a common legacy and a common heritage. They are, they are soul, twin souls. It is not in the imagination of the codependents. It is absolutely true. Both narcissism and codependency are post-traumatic conditions. But narcissists chose one solution, codependents chose another. But still, they come from the same country. They inhabited the same war zone. They suffered the same casualties. They are both wounded identically. They bleed the same way. And so, the minute they see each other, they recognize a twin. And the bonding is ultra, extremely powerful, almost unbreakable. And this is precisely what we call trauma bonding. Probably most of you heard of it. So we have codependency and narcissism. And you remember that I said that both these are post-traumatic conditions. Both these involve someone who refuses to grow up. These are cases of arrested development. Both of them are cases of arrested development. These are cases of people who have attachment disorders. They don't know how to attach functionally. The codependent attaches by vanishing. 
by eliminating herself, by disappearing. She attaches by disappearing. The narcissist attaches by consuming. It's a perfect match. The codependent wants to be consumed. The narcissist wants to consume. It is perhaps the only case in nature where the prey seeks the predator and experiences fulfillment by being consumed. And so narcissists and codependents, when they meet, they start a dance macabre, sort of a sick dance, where the narcissist probes, probes the boundaries and the borders of the codependent. It's like the codependent is encased in a gel, in some kind of gel, some kind of uh, gelatin thing. And, and the narcissist puts his finger in and identifies the soft spots and where he can tear apart the cover. And then the codependent submits. She plays along. She collaborates. Because she lives, she experiences being alive only through another person. Codependents live vicariously, by proxy. Narcissists also live by proxy. Remember, narcissists and codependents come from the same background. Codependents live vicariously through other people. And narcissists feel that they are alive only when they consume other people, when they more precisely consume their input, known as narcissistic supply. But both of them, both of them feel alive only when they have consumed or been consumed by another person. In other words, they do not have an autonomous existence. Codependents and narcissists do not have personal autonomy. They are not autonomous units. They cannot survive alone. A codependent panics when she is alone. She experiences extreme anxiety, extreme depression. Many, of, many codependents become suicidal when they are alone. Many self-mutilate and many try to commit suicide. Similarly, a narcissist without sources of narcissistic supply, I can tell you from personal experience, a narcissist feels that he is disintegrating. When I don't have sources of supply, I feel like the painting by Salvador Dali, you know, with the molecules. I feel that I'm disintegrating, uh, floating into thin air. And so I need, I need this glue, and the glue is narcissistic supply. The codependent similarly, needs me. So this is the background. Now here's the problem. The problem is, as I started, I started by saying that the problem is that more and more of us <coughs> are no longer seen. Again, 100 years ago, your mother saw you, your father saw you, your cousin saw you, your grandmother saw you, your grandfather saw you. Your village saw you, your parish, your community. There were many people who saw you, even gossip about you. You were the center of attention. Malevolent attention very often, but malevolent attention is better than no attention, trust me. So there was always someone there to see you. Today, we are so alone and so atomized that many of us, are not seen by anyone. And you know the famous stories about people who die in apartment buildings and they are discovered weeks later because, you know, no one paid attention and so on and so forth. The other day there was a guy who shot, shot up a synagogue in St. Petersburg. And CNN went and interviewed several people who lived across the hall from him. They never saw him. One of them, a woman, saw him once but she didn't know his name. They have been living together across the hall for well over four years. This is, this is not being seen at its extreme. 
I would venture to say that he shot up the synagogue in order to be seen, finally, by someone. Never mind in which light. Just to be finally seen. So what happens when the majority of people are not seen? Well, we begin to have something called network effect. When an individual is not seen, individual becomes narcissist or codependent. What happens when everyone is not seen? Everyone becomes narcissistic or codependent. We are beginning to, to see narcissism and codependency on a societal scale, on the scale of collectives, on the scale of whole societies, whole cultures, and potentially whole civilizations, like Western civilization. Narcissism is no longer, no longer, an individual diagnosis. Narcissism is fast becoming the organizing principle of our society, the principle that gives meaning to our society, explains our behaviors, and imputes to us the, tra the traits that we adopt in order to be socially acceptable. To put it more simply, which is not something I do very often, <laughs> um, if an entire society is narcissistic, you, even if you don't want to, even if it's against your nature, even if you're trying actively to avoid it, you will become narcissistic. We are our society. If the condition to be socially acceptable, in other words, if the condition to be seen, is to conform, you will conform, period. Don't think you can resist. Resistance is futile. I demonstrated it to you, if you remember. You all stood up. You conformed. Never mind now, each one of you, I'm sure, had a different motivation. Some of you respected me, the more deranged type, respected me. <laughs> Some of you succumbed to peer pressure. Some of you, you know, didn't know what's happening. I mean, I'm sure each and every single one of you had an excellent reason why you stood up. But the fact is, you all stood up. You all stood up to conform is to be seen, and to be seen, remember again, is the key to human psychology. So if the price to pay is to be more narcissistic, you will become more narcissistic. If the price to pay is to be more codependent, each and every one of you will become more codependent. And again, remember, there is no difference between narcissism and codependency. Think about it this way. The narcissist is someone who is dependent on narcissistic supply and the sources of supply. So, in a way, the narcissist is the ultimate codependent. If the majority of people do not find solutions as to how to be seen, entire societies become narcissistic, psychopathic, psychopathic, and codependent. Consider the case of Nazi Germany. What happened in Nazi Germany? In 1919, the Germans were forced, shamed, and humiliated into signing the Versailles Contract. The Versailles Agreement was an agreement that degraded, demeaned, and ruined the pride and dignity of Germans of the Germans. In other words, the Germans were not seen. No one saw the Germans. They were lumped together into this abstract, and the, the abstract was humiliated. The Germans as Germans were not seen, because had, had anyone seen the Germans, the outcome would have been different. When we are vengeful, when we seek revenge, when we are aggressive, when we are angry, when we are traumatized, level of empathy goes down. Now, that's not a new age statement. That is based on studies in psychology. We know, for example, that traumatized people have much less empathy. 
than people who are not traumatized. This is why I sit alone at home, alone, of course, I'm not seen. I sit alone at home and I laugh, absolutely laugh, when I read trauma victims claiming that they have more empathy or they are empaths. Because the first thing that trauma does is eliminate empathy. So traumatized people have no empathy. The Germans were traumatized. They were mistreated. They were not seen. Result, someone who saw them. Adolf Hitler was a midget, ugly, hunchback, Austrian failure. But one thing he did well, he saw the Germans. He saw them. If you read the speeches of Adolf Hitler, they're all about, I see you. I see you, I feel you, I understand you, I sympathize with you, I empathize with you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. The Germans gave him all the power in the world because he saw them and he was the only one who saw them. So whole societies can become narcissistic, psychopathic, and we see, unfortunately, a similar trend today in numerous societies around the world. We have seen it in the United States where someone like Donald Trump was elected president of that country. Inconceivable only 10 years ago. Why? 40 million Americans are not seen, not seen by the political establishment, by academe, by anyone. They were shunted and relegated to ghost towns with closed factories with poverty levels which rival sub-Saharan Africa, with low education, et cetera, et cetera. They were not seen. And suddenly this guy came, Donald Trump, very poor man, exactly like them, not educated. I'm joking. He was the exact opposite of these people, but he saw them, and that was enough. Similar things are happening in Turkey, Erdogan, in the Philippines, Duterte, in uh, um, Brazil, Bolsonaro, wherever leaders emerge who claim to see the, the unseen, the invisible, they take over. So we are beginning to see narcissistic, psychopathic, and codependent societies, whole societies, and all the individuals in these societies conform. In Nazi Germany, when I say conform, you say to yourself, ah, oh, that's nonsense. Even if society is psychopathic, I can resist it. I can, I'm a good person. I will never be a psychopath. Right? Wrong. In Nazi Germany, the SS, Schutzstaffel, the SS, started with 12,000 members. 12,000 members. By 1941, when Nazi Germany invaded Russia, the official membership of the SS was 3.3 million people. 3.3 million, including teachers, uh, priests, etc., etc. The composition of a typical unit that killed Jews in the Holocaust was middle class, well educated people with no background in the military or some background only in the police. That's all. People became psychopaths in Nazi Germany because that was the only way to be seen. Don't kid yourself. It can happen anywhere. And if trends continue as they do, it will. Now you can say, okay, what this guy is talking about? We didn't come to hear a lecture about politics. What do I care what you came to hear? <laughs> I'm a narcissist. <laughs> I'm going to talk about what I want to talk. The reason I'm mentioning all this, talking a lot about Adolf Hitler and other favorite, favorites of mine, is that societies are being transformed as we speak. And each and every one of you is already infected. I'm coming to tell you that you have been infected. Like the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> right. They're all infected. In the United States, 
for example, starting 20 or 25 years ago, there was a new movement, new movement in education. It was called child empowerment. Did you hear about it? Every teacher in America, every teacher in the United States was taught to tell children, you are unique, you are special. And if you only put your mind to it, there is no limit to what you can do. I'm kidding you not. This is the official message in American education system. If you just put your mind to it, if you just decide, you can do anything you want. Life coaches all over the world and business coaches and so on and so forth are spreading exactly the same message. Educators, life coaches, gurus all over the world are spreading exactly the same message. It's a highly fallacious, of course, counterfactual, but a highly narcissistic message. Results, according to Twenge and Campbell, in a series of studies between 2003 and 2006, the number of, peop of students diagnosed through the narcissistic personality inventory, diagnosed with extreme narcissistic traits, the number of these students went up five times. There were five times more narcissists in 2006 among the student body than in 1985, which is the baseline. That's the result of the education system doing its thing. In July 2017, the famous science magazine, New Scientist, by the way, published close to home, published in the United Kingdom, not in the United States. New Scientist, which is a British science magazine and one of the two best in the world, together with Scientific American, had a cover story, July 2017, cover story, teaching parents, advising parents to teach their children how to become narcissists. I am not kidding you. So don't think, don't think that what I'm saying is theoretical, far away, there is time. There is no time. You have no time left. And all of you are already indoctrinated via the media, via the education system, online. You're all already infected to varying degrees and various varying measures. In every study we have, the level of empathy is down by anywhere between 40 and 70 percent in all populations, including nurses and medical doctors, in every study we have. Narcissism shot up, depending on the country, as I said, between three and five times. Today, in clinical settings, we diagnose 3% of people with malignant narcissism. The figure in 1989, when Theodore Millen wrote his Personality Disorders in Daily Life, which is the Bible, in 1989, the figure was 0.3%. Today, 3%. So, the situation is becoming worse and worse. The thing is this, you are being taught to be assertive, to be self-confident, to develop self-esteem, to trust yourself. Everyone is teaching you that, especially Granon. Grannon and I have this, uh, don't, I mean, <laughs> don't take it seriously. He's by far my favorite, my favorite online guru. <laughs> but there is this message in the air. You should be more assertive, more self-confident. You should have more self-esteem and so on and so forth. And nothing, of course, is wrong with this message, except that no one is telling you where is the limit. Where is the boundary beyond which self-confidence become, becomes arrogance or self-esteem becomes vanity and assertiveness becomes aggression? No one gives you any quantitative or even I would say qualitative indicator where you should stop. 
and that's a serious problem because uh, all inhibitions are imported. We know in psychology that inhibitions are perhaps the only mental construct that is part of socialization and acculturation. In other words, it comes from outside. You can't develop it from inside. You know the famous, um, the famous book and uh, movie, um, Lord of the Flies. So you have these kids and they're on an island and they develop actually narcissism and so on. But these kids have a problem because no one is socializing them. No one is teaching. So they have no inhibitions. These kids have no inhibitions. By the way, the kids develop traditions, rules, procedures, and a proto-state, proto-country, proto-government. So they develop everything. Everything happens, except they don't have inhibitions because inhibitions come from outside. And the problem is that if no one teaches you where to stop, you will not stop. We say that uh, if no one teaches you inhibition, you will be disinhibitory. In other words, you will simply not stop. It's a perpetuum mobile. And this is exactly what's happening, what's happening in my view. There were decades of psychologists and gurus and coaches and I don't know what, telling all of you that you should be assertive and self-confident and, and have self-esteem and, and so on and so forth. And yet they neglected to tell you when to stop. Consequently, I think many, many people went overboard. And I think narcissistic phenomena are multiplying. And the thing is this, narcissism is an epidemic. It's contagious. It's exactly like Ebola, only much faster. Victims know that. Victims of narcissistic abuse know that. You start your life with a narcissist. You get married to a narcissist. At the beginning, you're nice, you're empathic, you're loving, you're caring, you're engulfing, you're everything. Five years later, you're a narcissist. You're aggressive, you're disempathic, you're humiliating, you're insulting, you're vicious, you're malicious. Narcissism is contagious. So if 10% of these people didn't know where, where to put the border, the boundary, and became narcissistic, another 10 were infected, and they infected another 10, et cetera, et cetera. And we have this, in my view. Consequently, consequently, your chances of coming across a narcissist today are much higher than when I was a kid. Actually, when I was a kid, uh, remember the dinosaurs and so on? So when I was a kid, no one, no one mentioned the word. The word was unheard of. Actually, wh why, why, talk about being, why talk about being a kid? In 1995, when I started my work on narcissism, no one heard of narcissism, not a single person. I started the first website, and that's how it all started. No one heard of it. And for many years, it was difficult for me to explain what is a narcissist. I remember that we spent many years just explaining what is a narcissist. But today, it's not a problem. It's in movies, it's in, on, in the news. Poli politicians are analyzed as narcissists and so on and so forth. I mean, narcissism is a meme. So you are much more likely to come across narcissists today. The more you are exposed to narcissism, the more you're infected. Your immunological system is destroyed the more, the more often you come across narcissists. You have immunity against narcissism, but it's destroyed by exposure to narcissism. And this exposure today is much higher than before. So what's happening? Where you started with assertiveness and self-control and self-esteem, you end up with grandiose fantasies. So even if you start in a healthy way, you end up being grandiose. And you can see it online. Go online and read the comments sections. Comment section on Facebook, on YouTube, and so on. Everyone is a genius. Everyone is an expert. Everyone knows everything about everything. You can teach no one nothing. Your facts are your facts. His facts are his facts. Your truth is your truth. 
He has his truth. She has her truth. The people online are utterly narcissistic. Now, you could say, well, that's a tiny minority. It's not a tiny minority. Well over 300 million people are active daily, active daily, online. According to Facebook, in a typical week, 700 million people access their accounts. According, according to Google, 1.4 billion people are active online in every given week. This is not a small number. Consider the fact that 3.9 billion people are adults. The rest are children. So 3.9 billion people, 1.4 billion is half. This is a representative sample. Narcissism is on the rise. And it creates a phenomena that I dubbed malignant egalitarianism. Malignant, malignant egalitarianism is everyone is as good as ev everyone. Everyone is as knowledgeable as everyone. Everyone should have the same power as everyone. Everyone is equal to everyone. Now this sounds like very democratic. It's actually very narcissistic, of course. Not everyone is equal to everyone, trust me. They are retards and they are geniuses. I repeat, they are retarded people and they are geniuses. D according to the very foundation of statistics, fi exactly 50% of people have less than average IQ. What to do? It's called median IQ. The median IQ today, by definition, is 100. It is adjusted all the time, going up. But it's 100, by definition. Exactly 50% of people have less than, than 100, by definition. That's what it means, median. These people don't have the capacity of the other half who are above 100. And of course, they don't have the capacity of someone with 190. Me. <laughs> that got you quiet. OK. So what am I saying here? Who knows? <laughs> what am I saying? I'm saying that in response to several of the, of the questions during the break, what I'm saying is that hitherto, until now, narcissism, pathological narcissism, has been, has been treated as a personality disorder. I am trying at this stage single-handedly, but hopefully not for long, but I'm trying to recast pathological narcissism, not as a personality disorder, but a po as a post-traumatic condition. Now, trauma can happen at any stage in life. Trauma can happen in childhood and can happen much later. So it's possible to, ha to have, like in dementia, it's possible to have late onset narcissism. There were hints of this before. There's something called situational narcissism. Situational narcissism. Studies, studies found out that among rock stars, among celebrities, there is a marked rise in the score on narcissistic personality inventory. In other words, these people were totally normal. And then when they became stars, they became narcissists, clinical narcissists, diagnosed. So this is late onset narcissism. It's called situational narcissism in academe. But I'm trying to generalize it. I'm trying to say that narcissism can develop at any stage in life because it is not a personality disorder at all. It is a combination of four elements. Um, attachment disorder, attachment problems, post-traumatic condition, and the trauma can happen at any time, addictive personality, having an addictive personality, because narcissists are addicted to attention, narcissistic supply, adrenaline, they're risk takers like psychopaths, so addictive personality. And so if you, and, and of course uh, regressive, regressive elements, in other words, uh, narcissists are like children. Now what I'm saying is not merely, not merely cosmetics 
or semantics. It explains exactly why all known therapies fail with narcissists. All therapies we know are a complete failure when it comes to narcissists. They modify, the success is to modify some behaviors and that's it. But none of the therapies we know, not one, not a single one, touches the core of the narcissist or heals or cures narcissism. Why? I am saying because they are, they are treating the wrong condition. First of all, all the therapies talk to the narcissist as though the narcissist is an adult. But the narcissist is not an adult. It's a child. We need to use techniques from child psychology, not from adult psychology. Second, they treat narcissism as a problem of personality. But narcissism is not a problem of personality. The personality of the narcissist, shock, in my view, is utterly okay. It's perfectly functional. Healthy narcissism, all of you have healthy narcissism. It's a good thing. All of you should have healthy narcissism. So the personality is okay, but it is subjected to enormous torsion, and torsion enormous stress known as trauma. It's a post-traumatic condition, like a Vietnam vet, or like, uh, you know, a woman who's subjected to domestic violence for 20 years. It's a traumatic condition. So, of course, no one succeeds to cure narcissism. But to answer the question, yes, of course, what I'm saying is that narcissism is contagious by virtue of socialization, acculturation, by virtue of social signaling, social cues, conformity to social mores and ethos, um, and so on. You can acquire, acquire narcissism. You can become narcissist, late onset narcissist. That's what I'm saying. Now all these, just to make clear, I'm not available. All these, all these are revolutionary claims. So don't go around don't go around thinking that this is, this is what they teach in university, the orthodoxy. These claims are utterly new and not accepted yet by the academic establishment. I'm teaching uh, courses in personality theory in several universities where I'm kind of poisoning the students with my ideas. But otherwise, if you go to Harvard, they will not recognize any of these ideas, of course. So... But I, I'm pushing, um, with my limited resources, I'm, I'm pushing towards this direction. Narcissism is an epidemic. Generally, I think psychology would do well to adopt epidemiological models because many human behaviors and many technologies are virus-like. They behave like viruses. So, for example, Richard and I were shooting some documentary, and, and I, I told Richard that I consider social media to be a form of virus, to have virus-like behavior. And the same with narcissism and psychopathy and uh, psychopathy and codependency. I think they are viral, and they can modify behaviors of people. They can invade your mental DNA and mutate it. You can become mutated by being exposed to narcissists and to codependence, but especially to Nazis. So this is just to clarify what I've been saying. So I'm trying to switch the conversation, to change the conversation from narcissism as a clinical entity, like let's say tuberculosis or cancer. I'm trying to change this and to say that narcissism is mainly a social and interpersonal dysfunction based on trauma and attachment problems and so on. So to make it more context dependent, not something in the air. Um, it's very interesting because, for example, we have studies of narcissists and psychopaths in prisons. And I can tell you that narcissists stop being narcissists very fast when they're in prison. 
There are two types of narcissists in prison. Dead narcissists, <laughs> those who did not stop, and all the others. And all the others are not narcissists. I mean, suddenly, all the behaviors vanish, the arrogance, the superiority, the entitlement, everything vanishes. We also know that narcissists modify their behavior according to context. For example, if a narcissist wants to succeed in a job interview, they put, they put up a facade which is utterly non-narcissistic. So it seems that narcissists can turn on and off their narcissism. Do you know anyone with cancer who can do that? I don't. Do you know anyone with tuberculosis who can turn on and off his tuberculosis? I don't, and Kafka didn't. So, it seems that narcissism is not like tuberculosis, not like cancer. In other words, it's what we call acquired, acquired parameter, acquired behavior, exactly like learned helplessness, which we can reverse very easily. So, it gives a lot of hope to treating narcissists, because if narcissism is an acquired thing, and if it is dependent on trauma, we know how to treat trauma very, very effectively. We have no idea how to treat narcissism and psychopathy, but we cure and heal trauma victims almost 80 or 90 percent, depending on the trauma. So if it's accepted that narcissism is trauma-based, chances for healing are very high. Actually, I developed a treatment modality which um, I'm using on uh, unfortunate uh, patients, and uh, the results are promising, but I will not go into it right now. As society, as society becomes more and more narcissistic and more and more psychopathic, the gatekeepers of society, the scholars, the intellectuals, the leaders, the opinion makers, the first movers, the shakers, adapt. They adjust. Suddenly, you see in universities studies about high-functioning narcissists, productive narcissists. Narcissists are great in business. They are wonderful leaders. They have traits and behaviors which are conducive to creativity, profit-making, etc., etc. Suddenly, narcissism is not so bad. You have scholars like Maccabi, Michael Maccabi or Kevin Dutton, who say that for pos certain positions, like, for example, military leader, political leader, for these positions, it's better to knowingly and consciously select for psychopaths. Kidding you not. Suddenly, psychopathy and narcissism are in vogue, bon ton, in universities. So, of course, these are the opinion makers. And then think tanks adopt it. And I can show you, or you can go to YouTube and find for yourself, I can show you interviews where psychologists and psychiatrists appear on CNN and so on. And they say, yes, Donald Trump is a great guy. It is precisely because he is a high-functioning narcissist that he is exactly the man for the job, etc., etc., etc. This was, would have been unthinkable 15 years ago, 10 years ago. You know what? Five years ago. Unthinkable. But now everyone is adapting and adjusting. It's like bullying. Bullying. When you have a single bully, uh, the weaker members of society and so on coalesce around the bully, and together with the bully they, bully, they bully others. So, these are all infectious phenomena, and I'm using models from epidemiology to, to explain them. Now, in epidemiology, we have two, two interesting insights, two interesting observations. First of all, viruses infect very fast. They have network effects, which would explain Facebook. They have networks, they spread very fast. But then suddenly they stop. It's called self-limitation. They stop. Did you ever bother to ask yourselves why the Black Death in 14th century Europe 
didn't kill all the Europeans, which would have been a great thing for Africa. Why? Why this virus suddenly stopped? Why Ebola didn't kill, you know, millions of Africans? Why AIDS didn't kill everyone in its wake? Why viruses stop? Well, they stop because humans are food. And you never eat the whole refrigerator. You leave something for tomorrow. Same, exactly same, is happening with narcissists, with psychopaths. They have, they have self-limiting behaviors. The behaviors of narcissists and psychopaths are self-limiting. This is a crucial, and by the way, totally new insight. I think maybe you're the first group that hears it, as far as I know. <laughs> it's a new, um, you're my guinea pigs. It's a new, uh, new insight in the sense that if you look at narcissists and psychopaths, they never destroy absolutely everything. And for example, consider an a intimate relationship, narcissist and codependent, intimate relationship. The narcissist would push the codependent to a certain limit and then suddenly will stop. We call this intermittent reinforcement. Yes? Hot and cold, hateful and loving, but actually it's viral self-limitation. The narcissist knows how to push to a certain point where it would become non-productive to continue to push. And he stops. Same with psychopaths. For example, we, ha we have many cases documented by Robert Hare, among others, of psychopaths who stole millions. They stole millions from banks, from savings institutions in the 1980s. But no one, not even Robert Hare, no one asked the question, why did they steal only millions when they could have stolen hundreds of millions? Or why did they steal 20 million when they could have stolen 50 million? because of self-limiting behavior. Now, this is great news and very hopeful news because it means that once narcissism or psychopathy reach a critical level in the population, exactly like the Black Death or Ebola or AIDS, it will stop at that point. There will be self-limitation. The epidemic will stop. And that's an interesting scenario. But at this stage, we are only at the beginning of the epidemic, or the very beginning of the epidemic. And at this stage, there are many scholars, as I said, and academics who are fanning the flames of this epidemic. Let's talk about romantic relationships, then I will shut up, yeah, and you will be able to ask questions. In romantic relationships, it's a bit, um, it's an oxymoron, it's a contradiction in terms. Talk about romantic relationship with a narcissist, <laughs> with a psychopath, or a relationship. I mean, but okay, in what you call romantic relationships with narcissists and psychopaths, I have claimed for a very, very long time, and, and I've been hated for it, that there is a very high level of complicity of so-called victims. And I think this complicity comes in four forms, in four ways. Start with passivity. Victims adopt, victims, so-called, adopt a stance of passivity. I mentioned it yesterday in the seminar. So there is a, a phrase like N magnet. The victim is a magnet, like a force of nature. She's not responsible for it. She's just a magnet. And she attracts narcissists and so on. It's a very passive view. There's no ownership of the contribution of the victim to the situation. Even the, the word victim or survivor or end magnet, all these phrases imply passivity. The impacted person, the codependent, for example, is a receptacle, a container, fixed in space, fixed in time, and here comes the obnoxious narcissist and pours acid into it or something, or some toxic, toxic material, toxic sludge. But it's never ever 
the containers fault, because containers are containers. That's what they are designed to do. They're designed to contain. Passivity is a form of complicity in abuse. And the vast majority of victims and survivors, so-called, are passive by choice. They love these metaphors. Whenever there's a new metaphor of passivity, all the victims jump on it. They all become empath. Empath, this utterly idiotic word. Utterly idiotic. Everyone has empathy. With the exception of narcissists and psychopaths, everyone has empathy. There is no such thing as an empath. Every human being has empathy. There is a fraction, less than three people in one million, who have heightened empathy, very, very high level of empathy, and they are known clinically as super empaths. But there's three people in one million. In this room, there's not one who is a super empath. You're all merely human beings. But empath, what is empath? I can't help it. I have empathy. I can't help it. It's not my fault. I was born that way. I'm empath. Rubbish, of course. So passivity. Second thing, second form of complicity is malignant optimism. The utterly grandiose belief, <coughs> utterly grandiose belief, narcissistic defense, that your love, your empathy, your caring, your nurturance can affect any change, however minor, in the narcissist and psychopath. Utterly delusional, grandiose belief. None of this has any effect or impact or consequence and is never of interest to the narcissist and psychopath. But malignant optimism, if I only love him enough, oh, he's a wounded child, if I only, you know, I can see the child in him. These are all forms of malignant optimism. I explained yesterday why this recurrent theme of child, because the narcissist and psychopath present, present the child. Remember, they are frozen in time. They are really children. So they present the child first to captivate you, and then, you know, you're hooked. But malignant optimism is a form of complicity. Then there is mythologizing. Mythologizing. You've been married to an asshole. You've had a bad marriage. Happens. Happens. <laughs> Shocking, but happens. No. You have to mythologize it. Your abuser is the greatest since Attila the Hun. It is a war between good and evil. <laughs> it is of cosmic consequence. You're going to write a book about it. <laughs> Everyone is writing a book about it. You are going to leverage your experience to help millions never to... I mean, <laughs> give me a break. You had a bad marriage. So what? 53% of all marriages in the West disintegrate for good reason. They're bad. Simply bad. Mismatches, assholes, jerks. Most of them men, I agree. But that's all. That's all that happened to you. You've had a bad marriage. Some of these assholes and jerks are narcissists and psychopaths. So you've had a very bad marriage. But you are aggrandizing and mythologizing. What am I saying? I'm saying that you're narcissistic. You have been infected. If you go to support groups of serial killers, you will see more empathy and compassion than many of the support groups for victims of narcissistic abuse. Utterly vicious forms. Sorry. You came to this lecture. From me, you hear only the truth. The interactions on many of these so-called support groups are anything but supportive. There is a lot, a lot of power plays, mind games, viciousness, uh, grandiose malignant narcissism and so on. Not entirely your fault. You've been infected. You've been exposed. That's a form of inoculation. But identify your grandiosity. I can cure him with my love is a delusional grandiose uh, statement. It's good against evil is a delusional grandiose statement. He is the worst abuser since Adolf Hitler 
is a delusional grandiose statement. There's only one such person, and it's me. <laughs> so only my wife, Lydia, can say that. I don't exist. <laughs> of course you don't exist. You're 20 years with me. <laughs> what do you mean? How can you? So, victimhood, victimhood becomes a profession. Victimhood becomes the fount and the source of the meaning of life. It gives your life meaning. It's easy to fall into the trap of victimhood because victimhood is a very narcissistic, grandiose stance, especially if it becomes, if it permeates you and defines you. So I saw many, many survivors of such marriages define themselves as survivors or as victims, not as, for example, a teacher of psychology or a farmer or a carpenter, but as a victim. It becomes a defining, uh, uh, an identity. Victimhood becomes an identity, a profession, and a source of meaning. It's a very dangerous trap. What you don't understand, I think, is that to be such a victim is to be a narcissist in disguise. It's as simple as that. And I know it's not a popular view, especially here. I call this Münchhausen by narcissist. <laughs> you know, there is death by cup. You go to a cop in the United States, you tell him you are fat, ugly, and your breath stinks. You're dead. He kills you. That's called death by cop. <laughs> Münchhausen by narcissist is using, using a narcissist to attract attention. Using the narcissist in your life to attract attention to yourself. Especially attention of life coaches, mini gurus, celebrities, whatever. Especially such attention. You know what is uh, Minhausen syndrome? Yeah. Yeah. Minhausen syndrome. These are mostly women, by the way, don't be insulted, mostly women who feign and fake illnesses and diseases and sometimes really hurt themselves, take poisons, mutilate, whatever, just in order to secure the attention of medical staff. Only medical staff, by the way. And then there is Minhausen by proxy. These are again women who use their children usually, but not only, sometimes parents, sometimes, and they hurt the children or hurt the parents with poisons and everything so as to secure attention, usually of medical staff. I say that there is a new phenomenon of Minhausen by narcissist. These are women who use the fact, the fact, I'm not disputing the fact, I'm not invalidating, there is a narcissist, so they are using the fact that there is a narcissist or a psychopath in their lives to suddenly gain attention, sometimes admiration, definitely sympathy, pity, and so on and so forth, and especially from specific figures, specific usually online figures. It's a whole new cult, a whole new um, subculture. It's a subculture. I, uh, there are many, many support groups with 250,000 members, many. On Facebook, you can find hundreds of support groups with 50,000 members. We are talking millions, millions. So I'm warning, I'm, I'm sounding the alarm about this phenomenon, and it is a prime example of infection, prime. Because all these women, I think, without exception, before they were exposed to the narcissist, I don't think they were narcissistic, or at least not that narcissistic. But now they are. And if you wanted an example of infection or epidemic, this, I think, is it. So, with this upbeat note, <laughs> I will now open the, the stage to a brawl. And anyone wants to beat me, please stand in queue. <laughs> My wife first, of course. <laughs> so if you have questions, I'm available. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, you have to raise my voice. Huh?
passivity, malignant optimism, let me consult my notes, <laughs> uh, mythologizing, and the fourth one is uh, aggressive victimhood, narcissistic victimhood. It's a complicity because when you are, when you are, when you as a victim, when you are rewarded, when you are reinforced as a victim, when being a victim is, uh, feels good because you get attention, this, that, you have no incentive to stop being a victim. You have no incentive. So it's a form of complicity. We are, we are animals. We are conditioned. If we push the lever, if we push the lever and we get attention, we push the lever and we get sympathy, we push the lever, and, so we will keep on pushing the lever. It encourages victimhood behaviors. This, this system of rewards and positive reinforcement encourages the victim to remain victim. In this sense, it creates complicity. I, let's be democratic. I'm against democracy, but let's be democratic. Yes. That's precisely what I'm saying. When society itself is transformed into a narcissistic, psychopathic environment, a cesspool, then it's very difficult to remain non-narcissistic, non-psychopathic. You continue to behave in a non-narcissistic, non-psychopathic way. Try. You try. If you had you changed your behavior and became narcissistic and psychopathic, you, your outcomes would have been much better. You have incentive to behave like a narcissist and a psychopath in a narcissistic, psychopathic society. In Nazi Germany, you had incentive not to hide Jews, but to turn them to the Gestapo. You understand what I'm saying? Society forces you to modify your behavior to obtain better outcomes. Yeah, but then you dismantle society. You, you don't dismantle, you change its nature, change its character. Let's uh, see if there are additional questions. Uh, yeah? So, what would be the boundaries between the assertive and the narcissist? What would be the, the boundaries, the, the boundaries critically depend on context and uh, especially social context. And that's precisely what, I, what I've been trying to say. That because society itself is becoming narcissistic and psychopathic, these boundaries essentially vanished. Essentially vanished. It's part of the infectious process. So you start by trying to be non-narcissist, non-psychopath, but just assertive and so on. But it's very easy to deteriorate and become a narcissist because society no longer, no longer puts this perimeter and tells you up to here. Actually, society encourages you not to have a boundary. Society tells you you're not assertive enough. Society, you know? defines. society defines it, of course. This is social behavior, socially acquired behavior. But if society is disinhibitory, Society has no inhibitions. You are disinhibitory as well. <laughs> so in certain societies, for example, sexual behavior is much, fr much more free than in other societies. Why? Think about it for me. Why? Because society signals. This is called signaling theory. Society signals to you. It's okay. You can, you know, there's no boundary. Go on. Same with assertiveness. You try to be assertive. You're testing. We are all testing. We're all sending signals all the time. I try to be assertive with you, for example. I try to be assertive. I see how you react, how, you know, how others react. How, and this is how the boundary is formed. But if all society signals to me, 
you know, go on. You're not assertive enough. Further, look at Donald Trump. You know, and so <laughs> there's no inhibition, no internalized inhibition. And everyone becomes disinhibitory. So it's precisely, precisely what is happening in the world today on all fronts, from sexual behavior to, to uh, aggression. Or, uh, yes. Until about, uh, until about 10 years ago, um, narcissism was considered mainly a male, male phenomenon, congruent with social mores, patriarchy, if you wish, in some societies, of course, and so on and so forth. But today we don't think so. Today, today we believe that narcissism is a, a gender-neutral behavior, and the only parameter that effectuates it is opportunity. Men have many more opportunities to be narcissistic than women. But we have discovered in studies that when women are given the same opportunities, they are as narcissistic as men, absolutely. And there are also behaviors that are not necessarily narcissistic, but for example, um, adultery, extramarital affairs. We discovered that when women have same opportunities like men, they are equally adulterous. But of course, in absolute terms, men cheat much more than women. But we discovered that's because of opportunity. So today, the prevailing thinking is that it's all opportunity related, not power structure related, not, of course, biology related, not uh, psychology related, but simply a matter of does the person have the opportunity to act or not. If the opportunity arises, they will act. We even discovered amazing things. For example, in studies of cheating men, we discovered that the vast majority of cheating men cheated with women who were older and much uglier than their own wives. And when we asked why, most of them said because we could. There was opportunity. So today we place huge emphasis on, on opportunity. Of course, opportunity inevitably is connected to the social power structure. The more power you have, the more opportunities you have. Ask Harvey Weinstein. So uh, women still don't have enough power to have enough opportunities. But in, sev in some societies, it's already changing. For example, in most societies in the West, women uh, are a majority in colleges and universities. Anywhere between 30 and 40% of breadwinners are women, uh, depending on the country. I'm not going now into each country, but uh, and in certain professions like legal profession, medicine, women women are the majority. Even in IQ tests, women uh, not long ago equaled men and then passed them. So the, Richard and I have two <coughs> two videos online a conversation about the collapse of patriarchy and the future is female. So I recommend that you have a look. Yes. What's the difference between Nazis and borderline? There, there, we are in the throes of a major, major change in in um, thinking in psychology. Until more or less 2009 we made lists, we made lists, like borderline is one, two, three, four, nine, Narcissus is etc. So we made lists, and this was called the categorical approach. Each diagnosis was a category with well-defined criteria and so on. It was uh, very primitive, it's like making grocery list, or like Linnaeus, who classified plants, and so we call, we call it taxonomic system, system of classification, and it's very descriptive, but doesn't tell us anything about processes, dynamics, 
clinical picture, nothing. It's just a list. You know. uh, DSM-5, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, is a revolution already because DSM-5 is what we call dimensional. Not fully. Still, there are very strong interests from the pharmaceutical industry not to become dimensional. But in the dimensional approach, we are beginning to think that all these distinctions between borderline, narcissistic, this, that, are pretty artificial distinctions. They are gender biased and they are culture biased, culture bound, as we call it, culture bound. So um, there are suggestions now to have a single personality disorder with emphasis which is a suggestion that I made in 95. 95 was suggested to put all personality disorders to make it one with emphasis. Uh, but it's, of course, not because of me, but I'm just saying I agree. I, I made the same suggestion. And uh, I think that that will be the end of it. Because, I mean, that, that's what will happen. Because um, the tests that we use to diagnose borderline include a, strong, a module for narcissism. The test, the PCLR, which is the test we use to diagnose psychopathy, has a module for narcissism, etc. So uh, you can't, uh, the diagnostic tools are not separate. Only the diagnosis are separate. It's an extremely bizarre situation. Total divorce between those who test and those who diagnose. And this cannot continue. I think that, I suggested in 95, that borderline narcissist, histrionic, and psych psychopath, psychopaths and others, I suggested that they are all, all of them are about narcissistic supply. All of them have to do with narcissistic supply. Only each one has a different type of supply. Narcissist is attention, histrionic is flirtation, seductiveness and sexuality. Um, borderline is uh, mainly um, presence, to be present, abandonment anxiety, and so on. But uh, that's one way of looking at it. But I think ultimately all of them will, be, will become one. So all these, uh, all these lists. And also, <laughs> also it's very, very constructed very stupidly. Um, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 3, 4, and text revision, uh, we have something called polythetic, polythetic form. Means that if you satisfy five out of nine criteria, you're diagnosed. So I can have two narcissists, two narcissists. One of them will satisfy five, these five, and the other one will satisfy another five. And they will have in common only one criterion, but they are both narcissists. How is this possible? It's utterly idiotic. Imagine someone with tuberculosis and tuberculosis, and the only thing in common between the two of them is that they go to the toilet. <laughs> it's completely insane structure, and as a result, we have comorbidity where people are diagnosed with many... Okay, let's not go into a lecture. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, just uh, gentlemen, gentlemen. Um, so my question is based around the idea of society, right? Um, impacting the way that you become narcissistic or get infected, as you mentioned before. Um, if in my society, um, I'm, I'm given a perception of that narcissist and aggressiveness and a number of other things are all very bad, then I decide to tone that down. But then in my day-to-day -day actions or to achieve specific actions, I need a bit of narcissism to know when somebody's trying to talk to me and they're not trying to talk to me, or like to know when somebody wants me to be a bit more assertive and I'm not being a bit more assertive. How do you find the right balance in order to... Where are you from? Pardon? Where are you from? Which, which country? Which country? Oh, I was born in Zimbabwe. Um, Zimbabwe, because oh. yeah. I, I spend a lot of time in Africa. Um, there are, narcissism is a, like a constant, a constant of nature, constant quantity. If it cannot be expressed via the individuals, it's, ex it's expressed by the, via the collective of the individuals. For example, in Japan, no one is allowed to be a narcissist. It's a highly collectivist society. And if you stand up or stand out, uh, society suppresses you, mocks you, uh, excommunicates you, ostracizes you. But the society as a whole is highly narcissistic. The Japanese believe they are superior. They are the most clever. They are the most amazing. They're, they think their aesthetic 
their aesthetics is superior to Western aesthetics, etc., etc. So Japanese are extremely highly narcissistic as a collective, but never or very rarely as individuals. In China, a very interesting phenomenon happened. Owing to Confu Confucianism, Confucius, the, most of the history of China, narcissism was expressed on the collective level. China, for example, believed that it was culturally superior to any other country in the world. And when Marco Polo came from Europe, they treated him as a barbarian. They refused even to meet the kings of Europe because they said they are barbarians, they are animals, they are savages. So China had grandiosity inbuilt into the culture, into society for millennia, for 5,000 years. And then China was exposed to American culture via mass media, via show, I mean, uh, television, movies, uh, smartphones, internet. And in 50 years, suddenly Chinese individuals are highly narcissistic. Society is still narcissistic, but the individuals started to be narcissistic to the extent that China revised its manual of mental health to include narcissism for the first time. So it's a prime example of infection. I used to live in Nigeria several years. And uh, it was the 80s, before, before and after the military coup. And I saw with my own eyes, with my own eyes, how tribal tribal narcissism became gradually collective narcissism as people studied in the West and came back or made a lot of money or bought flashy cars and flashy clothes. And I watched with my own eyes how narcissism was developing among individuals when before that it was restricted to the tribe. You, I mean, you couldn't really be a narcissist in a tribe. It was very controlled. So. I think it's only a question of how it, how it erupts. It's like water, where the water goes. But the water is there. Yes. There are no studies, of course. There are no studies because codependency is not a recognized mental health diagnosis. There is dependent personality disorder, but there's no codependency. So consequently, academia refuses to conduct studies using the construct of codependency. So we have no data, no data. But um, I think codependents are only one type of person who is attracted to the narcissist. And definitely not the only type that the narcissist is attracted to. So that's another myth that narcissists target. It's also a part of the mythologizing, you know, that narcissists target. You're special. You're special. If the narcissist targets you, you're special, you know. So, but narcissists don't. If you give me supply, if you give me supply for you, give me supply right now. I know nothing about you, but it's okay. You can be mine. I don't know if you're codependent, if you're, I don't even know if you're tall or short. All this is not relevant. The only question, can, can you and will you give me supply? The minute you stop giving me supply, you can be as codependent as anyone and I will dump you. <laughs> it's all about supply. It's like pushers. You don't fall in love with a pusher's personality. You say, wow, this pusher knows existentialism. It's amazing. I mean, I buy heroin from him, and then we talk about Sartre all night. It's a pusher. You know? You're going to buy drugs. Who gives a shit if he knows existentialism or not? You know? So it's the same with the, same with the narcissist spouse or intimate partner. She should give him supply. All the rest is utterly irrelevant. It's relevant only, I mean, the narcissist studies, studies his partner very deeply but only in order to manipulate her better to provide supply. Not because there's a specific profile that she has to fit. Narcissists are utterly omnivorous, indiscriminate, and equal opportunity abusers. So, 
I don't discriminate. I mean, freely, if you want to be abused, come to me afterwards. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you... Yesterday you had a seminar about divorcing, and I'm... In the about? Divorcing... Divorcing. Divorcing, divorcing a narcissist, sorry. I, I, I have a problem with hearing. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you have any advice as to how to handle them when they're basically just running amok <laughs> and not enjoying the divorce procedure at all. How do we get to settlement? How do you deal with them? There are well-established strategies on how to manipulate narcissists, how to get them to do what you want, but I'm not sure this is the right forum to go into each and every one of them. But if you go online, if you go online, there is literature, and there are many, many YouTube videos, uh, also by Richard, for example, but on my channel as well, on how to manipulate narcissists, get them to do what you want. <coughs> my website has a special page dedicated to divorcing a narcissist where you have links to 70 articles on all, each and every aspect of divorce including how to get narcissists to do what you want so there's mirroring and there's uh, uh, threatening them and there's providing them with supply how to make them think that the idea is their idea etc etc it's all and to tell you the truth many of you come across these techniques by yourselves you don't really need any education you came across the, you discovered that if you want the narcissist to do something, you find a way to convince him it was his idea. Or you give him supply. Or Narcissists are very easy to manipulate. They are very gullible. And they are very stupid. And we call this form of stupidity, pseudo-stupidity. Even the narcissist with the highest IQ <laughs> is essentially an idiot. So is very easy to manipulate if you care to manipulate but many people say I can't manipulate it's against my nature I feel degraded I feel and this is going back to the beginning of my lecture in a world full of narcissists and psychopaths you have to manipulate and it's true manipulating is a narcissistic trait you have to become a narcissist and that's one of the transmission mechanisms of the infection. That the narcissist forces you to become narcissistic just to survive. And if you don't, you will not. And if there's one narcissist, that's okay, you can avoid him. But what do you do if the infection is total? And you know, it's everywhere. In the court system, in law enforcement, in education system, in, among your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues, your... How many of your friends became narcissistic over the years? They were not so self-centered, they were not so egotistical, they were not so disempathic, and suddenly you discover that they are. How many of your neighbors suddenly erupt with unexpected aggression? How many of your colleagues at work sabotage you and stab you in the back and undermine you? And I mean, it's all over the place. It's the zombie ac apocalypse. You have to shoot them. Nothing else. Oh, uh, so if you say that narcissism is a response to trauma, then, but you also say that it's spread like an infection, so do you think that as a society that we are all so traumatized that we yes. will so easily... I think absolutely we are a traumatized society. Absolutely. And every time in human history that there was a traumatized society as a society, we had a surge, a normal surge in narcissism. And every collective that had been traumatized repeatedly developed narcissism that had become a part of the collective's acknowledged psychology. I'm sorry. I, I, Narcissists force you to be narcissistic, I just explained. You can't cope if you're not narcissistic. So if there's one in this room, you'll survive. But imagine that everyone here is a narcissist. You, you must... So, for example, if everyone here were a narcissist, they would not let you talk. They would suppress your speech or shout at you or whatever. And you will have to shout back if you want to survive. It's 
narcissism has many transmission mechanisms, but we have had cases in history of collectives, whole collectives, who were traumatized on a continuous, repeated basis. And these collectives are highly narcissistic. I belong to one of them. I'm a Jew. I'm sorry, it's not anti-Semitism. Jews are highly narcissistic. And they're highly narcissistic because they have been traumatized for thousands of years. Repeatedly, horribly, insupportably. They had to become narcissistic. Jews were forbidden to work in certain professions, in most professions, throughout human history. So they had to do things that today we identify with narcissism. Then they had to survive. They had to be narcissists. In Auschwitz, if you were not a psychopathic narcissist, you were not. And after that, when they established the state of Israel, and long before that, when they had a fight with Rome, big empire, and so on and so on and so forth, Jews had pogroms and holocausts and genocides repeatedly, thousands of times in the last 2,000 years. It worked. Most of them, I would say, are, are narcissistic. The collective is definitely narcissistic. The ethos is narcissistic. You have today a big part of the Jewish people and the Israelis who absolutely believe that they are truly chosen one way or another, and so on. They're very arrogant and vain and aggressive, and so that's an example. But you don't have, I mean, Jew is one, Jews is one, but for example, Russians. Russians are the same. <coughs> Highly narcissistic uh, collective. Even, I would say, crossed the line and became psychopathic collective. So, it, it's happening. It's, this is not theory. This is happening. All you need to do is uh, uh, roll the globe, I mean, swing the globe. And you will find many, 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 many examples of whole, whole cultures, society, civilizations and collectives who became narcissistic. Many religious minorities, many minorities who have been suppressed and so on and so forth. I see pronounced signs of narcissism among black, uh, black Americans. Pronounced signs. And I said it in one in a podcast and after that I, <laughs> I was uh, threatened severely. Um, I'm abusing her. She's used to it. <laughs> I don't kill you. No, okay. This, this gentleman, because I already pointed at him, and then this lady. So you've talked that uh, an individual narcissist will be destructive and self destructive. Now, if we take the example you keep bringing up of Nazi Germany and generally the world at the time, that we know that that societal narcissism, that event, ended in a destructive and self-destructive way. Uh, if you apply that to now and the future, what's your belief on that? So Self-destruction. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be in a mushroom cloud. Mm -hmm. There are many ways to self-destruct. For example, I think we are in the thick of self-destruction by, for example, being becoming totally isolated, totally atomized, very lonely, not interacting with each other, afraid of being traumatized, avoiding each other, retreating. I give, um, I give uh, in all my lectures, because I'm lazy, I give the same metaphor. Screens. When I was born, remember the dinosaurs, when I was born, there was this giant screen and 2,000 of us entered the same place and we ate popcorn and we made out, I will not go into details, and so on. And we were watching the same screen, which was a shared experience. And we were talking, and by the way, we were smoking, <laughs> and everything, and then we went out. And this shared experience was recounted to family members and so whole families. It was like, you know, wonderful. It was, it was one screen. Ten years after that, the screen became much smaller. That screen was cinema. Then the screen became much smaller. And that screen was called television. And now, we couldn't get 2,000 people to watch television. So we had 30, 40. And these 30, 40 shared the same experience and ate popcorn and made out and went out and told family members. But it was much, much smaller resonance 
in a much lesser shared experience. And then 10 years later, the screen shrank again, and it became the personal computer. And then only three people could share the experience, and then it shrank again, and only two could share. And now it shrank to the point that only one person can share this experience with himself, which is what we used to call when I was a child, masturbation. And, <laughs> and this screen, we have to hold like this. It's a design choice. Don't kid yourself. The screens could have been designed utterly differently, but it's a design choice. This screen separates us from the world. It's a firewall. It cuts us off. If you go to any airport, any airport, watch families, watch teenagers, gorgeous girls, and stunning boys paying no attention to each other. Sex is dead. Everything is dead. We live inside these screens. It's virtual reality. It's utter shared psychosis. You're telling me that we are not self-destroying? Are you kidding me? Dating among teenagers collapsed by 53%. Sexual acts among teenagers. This is life. Sex is the force of life. Sexual acts among teenagers collapsed by 60%. These are the studies of uh, Twench, those of you who want to... And Campbell, those of you who want to... 60%. In, in several countries, 80 to 90% of people under the age of 24 never, ever interacted with the other sex. Japan. In the United Kingdom, 40% of teenagers prefer video games far more than dating a girl. Dating a girl is number four. These are signs of dying, of death. We are dying, <laughs> alone, each one in his cubicle. We are dying. And you're telling me we're not self-destroying. This is much worse than any nuclear apocalypse. How many can you peel, kill with a nuclear apocalypse? But how many can you kill by destroying sex, by destroying love, by destroying romance, by destroying interpersonal interactions, by isolating ourselves, by atomizing ourselves? There's nothing shared. Even when we go online, we go into bubbles, like-minded bubbles. There's no fertilization anymore, no interdisciplinarity, nothing feeds, there's no food. We are consuming ourselves. This is what we call in biology auto autolysis. We are eating ourselves, and then we die. And that's the end of it. The apocalypse is here, don't you realize it? It's here. What time is it? No, it's until 10. But the uh, organizer said until 10 or? No, 9.30, okay. <laughs> I spoke to her, trust me. What does the organizer say? What's the, what's the time limit? Well, until what time can we? 9.30, okay. Yes. Why? I'm sorry, can you... I was going to ask you why you invented the term narcissistic abuse when it covers every type of abuse as well as very good reason for malignancy. But since there's no time, um, I'm rather going to ask um, how familiar you are with the work of Pete Walker and others who are trying to change psychology to a more trauma-based model. Um, and the idea that things like narcissism and codependency of maybe different manifestations of, of um, as far as I understand, uh, over reliance on different nervous system responses. So different sort of large amounts of chemicals and um, yeah, I can elaborate that I At the risk of sounding narcissistic. I, I suggested to use CPTSD in conjunction with narcissistic abuse in 95, so it was a bit before Pete Walker. But Pete Walker and the whole school, they are more, they are, they are very concerned with appearing to be medical, scientific, and so on. I'm adamantly opposed to the medicalization of human psychology because 
I think it's a narcissistic phenomenon. We do not know enough. We have just started. Our level of ignorance is enormous. To claim, to make any claim about the nervous system, the biochemicals of the brain, and so on and so forth, is very grandiose, simply. We know nothing, close to nothing. We have just discovered a totally new structure in the brain, which connects well over 80% of the brain. This discovery is six months ago. That's how much we know. To make any claims about the nervous system, the brain, neurotransmitters, genes, genes, polymorphisms, and so on, is the hubris and arrogance of narcissistic scientists and the ignorance of those who are trying to emulate and imitate them. This can and will happen, probably, in two, three hundred years' time. But the time had not come yet. We don't know enough, simply. Thank you very much for coming.